My name is Andrew Stotz, and I'll be your host as we continue our journey into the teachings of Dr. W. Edwards Deming. Today, I'm continuing my discussion with John Dews, who is part of the new generation of educators striving to apply Dr. Deming's principles to unleash student joy in learning. Today is episode 12, and we're continuing our discussion about the shift from management myths to principles for the transformation of schools, systems. John, take it away. Andrew, it's um, good to be back. Yeah, like you said, we, we've sort of turned to this set of principles that can be used by um, educational systems leaders to guide their transformation work. Um, like two episodes ago, we sort of kicked off the principles, gave a little bit of an introduction. We talked about principle one, which is uh, create constancy of purpose. And then the last time we talked, um, we, we uh, kind of broke down two principles. Principle two was adopt the new philosophy. And principle three was cease dependence on inspection to achieve quality. So in this episode, I was going to sort of take on the next two, the fourth and fifth principles. So the fourth principle is maximize high quality learning. And the fifth principle is work continually on the system. So I thought we'd sort of kick things off with principle four, that 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 idea around maximize high quality learning. And I think sort of I was going to capture that principle in just a couple sentences, I would say you know, you want to maximize high quality learning and minimize total cost of education by improving the relationship with uh, educational institutions from which students come and which from which they and to which they matriculate. So we're thinking about a single source of students coming into a system such as, you know, like an elementary school student moving into a middle school and seeing that as an opportunity to build a long-term relationship of loyalty and trust. So that's sort of the overarching idea. And I think if you sort of look at this principle through the, the lens of um, United Schools Network, where I work at in Columbus, Ohio, I think that's sort of a helpful lens. And, and when we think about our origin story, we started as a single middle school serving a few east side neighborhoods in you know near downtown columbus and i was the founding principal school director of that particular campus and at the time we decided we were going to open a middle school because this is the point often in a student's educational career where they fall so far behind they often then drop out of school altogether just a few years later. So we wanted to get them in, in middle school. So before we were this sort of network of schools, this school system, we were just this one school that grew from serving just sixth grade over the first few years to sixth through eighth grade, right? And when you looked at these east side neighborhoods where we were located, there were 15 or so elementary schools from the city school system that formed this sort of de facto feeder pattern into our middle school. Most of those schools were performing in the bottom 5% of schools in the state, which means when those students were sent, when, when those students then matriculated to our middle school, they typically did so, the, the typical kid was at least two, but, but more often three and even four grade levels below where they should be when they enrolled with us in sixth grade. And, you know, while I didn't have this Deming lens at the time, uh, I mean, I did sort of approach things from a process standpoint, from a system standpoint, but, you know, as the middle school principal and thinking about sort of all that entails to run a school and a new school at that. So we're, you know, uh, doing all the things that come with startup. There was no way for me to run around and form relationships with the, you know, the 15 principals leading those elementary schools from which our students were primarily coming from. And so, you know, when we had this opportunity to grow from one school into a network that's now four schools, 
we elected to grow down into elementary schools. The point in doing so was to move towards this sort of single supplier relationship that Dr. Deming outlined in his point four. And so now, you know, we have two middle school principals, two elementary schools in our network, and they can, you know, work together on a whole host of sort of quality characteristics, you know, like vertically planning curriculum across that K to eight pipeline. And, you know, we were middle schools first and then elementary schools. Mm -hmm. So while we're getting some of our students from our own elementary schools, we're, we're also still getting students from other uh, non-USN schools, non-USN elementary schools, but we're sort of increasingly moving toward that single supplier model. Um, and I, I think that coordination is one of the ways that we can then maximize high quality learning. And the great thing about this is that we then minimize the total cost of education. And I think this is one of the important paradoxes of Dr. Deming's work in that um, as quality goes up, price goes down, which that's sort of the opposite of what a lot of people think. Um, in the case of schools, what we're talking about in terms of you know minimizing cost, a lot of that has to do with less remediation of students as they sort of increasingly come from those USN elementary schools and not and they're not as typically far behind to when they arrive to our middle schools as they were previously. And for our for our international listeners and also just for a refresher for myself, uh, what is mid, is middle school? What we I used to call it junior high. I think I called it. But what what is middle school and elementary as far as your uh, grades and ages? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, middle school six through eight for us, so sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and then our elementary schools are kindergarten kindergarten through fifth grade. Got it. There's also this sort of um, I think when when Deming wrote his point for. His version said, you know, end the practice of awarding business on the basis of price tag. Instead, minimize total costs, move toward a single supplier for any one item on a long-term relationship of loyalty and trust. So I sort of translated, you know, Deming's framing to one that applies directly to students as they move through that K-12 pipeline. However, you know, there's also this second component to this principle that's more sort of directly analogous to Deming's point. And, you know, it's definitely applicable to the business of uh, the, you know, the business side of running schools. And, you know, this is the idea of, you know, ceasing dependence on price tag alone when we're selecting curriculum or technology or supplies or, you know, any number of, you know, goods and services that school systems regularly buy. I think just the main idea is here, you know, is to understand that that difference between the lowest bidder and the lowest qualified Bitter. You know, I think one of the things that Deming pointed out on this side of things was that basically price has no meaning without a measure of quality, you know, uh, being purchased, including that, you know, after sales service. So I think that's a, a key point as well. When when, when did you guys um, open the elementary schools? Yeah, so it's sort of unfolded over time. So the first middle school opened in 2008. Right. Second middle school, 2012. And then we moved toward elementaries in 2014 and 2017. But a key thing here is um, when we open new schools, we sort of have a slow growth model where we typically open with just a single grade level. Mm. So they can sort of, you know, put systems and processes in place, hire staff, <clears throat> recruit students, that type of thing. And so it took, you know, about five years before those elementary schools were mature enough that they were actually feeding into the, to the middle. So let's schools. say 2009, 2020, 2019, 20, and then onwards, you're starting to get the students from the elementary schools, you know, was, you know, was there a significant difference? You know, how would you describe the difference in what you received, you know, from your elementary school versus did, did in other words, did it deliver on what you had hoped? Yeah, I mean, I think we have work to do there. 
But for the, the typical student that's coming from our elementary schools, one, they're very familiar with our routines, our procedures, our sort of school culture, the way the schools run. A lot of those students um, often have older siblings that are either in our middle school or had been in our middle school or are now alumni. And then academically, we see a, you know, a difference as well, especially for those students that started early in elementary, like in K-1, because we take kids at all grade levels. Mm. But for those those kids that started K-1 and went all the way through our system and are enrolling now six years later or seven years later in sixth grade with us, the difference is stark, uh, both from a sort of um, sort of student, you know, traits and responsibilities and sort of a student academic side of things. And how does that changing, you know, I mean, ultimately what, what I think about, you know, Toyota is is a good example. And in, in Thailand here, Toyota has a huge manufacturing base. And part of what's so critical to that manufacturing base is all the supplier relationships that come with that. So mm -hmm. they're surrounded by their suppliers and they've built great relationships with those suppliers. Yep. In a sense, you know, you just happen to own that supplier in this case. But whether you whether you're owning the supplier or whether a listener or a viewer is saying, okay, I need to build a better relationship with the suppliers that I have. The question I have in your case is, how did that change the final result at the end of middle school? Because ultimately what you're trying to do is get your final output mm -hmm. of your system yep. to have, you know, to be better, you know, over time. And just curious, how did that, how do you, how is that reflected in what comes yeah, out? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it has a dramatic impact because, you know, so much of education and and what a student is ultimately going to do is sort of, I don't want to say determined, maybe a little bit too strong a word, but maybe not too far off by that sort of early education foundation. Specifically, did you learn to read proficiently? And when students were coming to us in middle school, without that foundation in reading, it makes it really, really hard now that when you get to a point in your schooling career where things have shifted from being, you know, sort of learning how to read to, you know, you are reading as a part of the learning, learning process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we did some intensive interventions before we had elementary schools to try to catch kids up, especially on that reading front. And those are really hard sort of interventions to sort of put in place when you know uh, when a kid is 12 or 13 years old when they're when they're getting those interventions not to say that they can't help but it, it just the, the older the student is the farther they've gone in their educational career the harder that that is and i guess that majority of um, public education you know educators are dealing with that all the time <laughs> people popping yeah. into their district and all of a sudden you know you know coming from many different sources and all yeah. of that Yep. And, you know, in some places that's more than others, you know, that sort of coming and going tends to be associated with um, certain conditions in which the uh, the school sits and the community in which the school sits where, you know, there's higher poverty rates, there's more movement. So one sort of stat that sort of jumps to mind on this front in the in Columbus city schools, which is where our kids would have gone had they not come to us, were mm -hmm. geographically within that district's boundaries in any given year 30 percent nearly one out of three kids changes school buildings during the year mm -hmm. which is just uh uh like an overwhelming number an overwhelming amount of sort of transition that's just within a year that's not mm -hmm. even you know across you know multiple years and uh so that's why this sort of you know single supplier <laughs> relationship is so so important because we're trying to sort of push back in, in an opposite direction. And is there ever a chance that you could have all of your students come from your elementary program or is that unrealistic or is that, is that happening or can happen? Well, right now it really can't happen. Um, but, and that's mostly due to the size of our building. So in our elementary schools, there's basically two, homerooms per grade level. So there's two fifth grade classrooms, let's say. But in our middle schools, there's at least typically three homerooms in sixth grade. 
So no matter what, right now, about a third of the kids would be would be new in a typical mm. school year. <clears throat> so capacity matching. Yep. Capacity matching. Yep. That's okay. Right. That's right. That's a that's a great um, explanation of, you know, the methodology you're using. I know there's people who are public school teachers that may be listening to this and going, oh, come on, I can't do that. Well, yeah, you're going to have different challenges and limits, but you can start to build those relationships with the schools that are, you know, bringing bringing students to you and and try to do the best that you can with that. Because we know that uh, what Dr. Deming taught was that, you know, fixing things at the beginning of the process is the way to do it. Because if you're trying yeah. to solve the problem at the middle or the end of the process, it just goes exponentially more complex, difficult, more costly. Yep. And that's the reason why low cost, or sorry, low, a high quality means low cost. Wait, what? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And some public schools do this really well. Um, and they, for all intents and purposes, already have this sort of set up. But sometimes I've seen, even in places like a smaller school district that maybe just has one elementary and one sort of middle high school building, I've been to a place where I have heard people say, I never even thought about leaving our building and going to see what they're doing in the high school, you know? So, uh, and then part of it, I get, you're sort of, you're a teacher, you're kind of stuck in your classroom. It has to be facilitated for you to have a sub or whatever, but it's not an overwhelming barrier. And I think it's a very valuable sort of exercise to have some of that cross movement, you know, <laughs> between buildings. And uh, I don't think it's actually that hard to do. And the, and the good thing is in most school districts, there's geographic proximity. So that's not a, that's not a barrier, but someone has to say, this is important and we're going to, we're going to do this, you know? So I think, um, I think it reminds me of my discussions with Bill Bellows, where we're talking about uh, also, you know, on the podcast and uh, trying to talk about the idea of thinking beyond specification and thinking beyond, you know, and asking the question, how is this product or service being used by the next part of the yeah. process? Right. And looking forward, you find that even if you think that you're doing really well, you all of a sudden find that there's yep. a huge amount of opportunity to improve in that yep. just that one step forward yep. in the process. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Does, does that bring us to work continuously yeah. on the system? Yeah, I would just say one, you know, the takeaway here for me is, you know, developing those partnerships with with suppliers, whether it's on that sort of K-12 pipeline side. Or if it's more like Deming's version of point four, we're actually making making you know purchases for the school system. I think a change in thinking uh, for me was that the suppliers are a part of your system, whether they're internal or external to the you know governance structure of your school system or your business. The suppliers are actually a part of the system, and thinking about them that way is is really important. Um, I think both those are approaches are sort of keys to helping maximize high quality learning and then minimizing that that total cost. And um, when I actually started to think about that, even though we didn't, again, think about it through this Deming lens early on, we have a number of vendors that sort of operate like that. Our IT vendor, our food services vendor have been with us since day one in 2008 when we started. And you'll see their employees doing things here almost like they work here. <laughs> they almost feel like an employee. So at least in certain cases, we've been able to develop those types of relationships on sort of more on the Deming business side of things as well. And I think that's just as important. There's an interesting business in, in the US that would, is a model for that. And that is, uh, so to talk about business aspect, a company called Fastenal that makes fasteners mm -hmm. and many different things that companies need. But they changed their business model many years ago to basically, rather than having a warehouse and distribution and you, you order from the warehouse and all that, they mm -hmm. actually set, they go into your factory and they oh, wow. take over your whole inventory mm -hmm. and they run your whole inventory department. And the benefit for you is that you don't own the inventory anymore. So you could have a million dollars in inventory in your factory. And all of a sudden that all goes onto their books. Wow. And the second benefit is that you only have the cost of that inventory at the moment that you take it out of their system and then put it into the operation that you're doing. And that, that is this relationship, this super close relationship of that 
supplier actually working at your facility. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. Yeah, it, it was, it's the shift a little bit from like, you know, antagonistic. I'm trying to get the lowest price out of my suppliers to wait a second. I need to get the highest quality at a fair price. And I'm going to work with you on an ongoing basis to make sure whatever, when, you know, whatever I'm buying from you on an ongoing basis is high quality as it comes into my system. That's mm -hmm. a much better way to operate than yep. sort of the antagonistic view. Yeah. So I think that's a good transition point from principle four to five. So principle five is work continually on the system. So as I was going to sort of sum up this principle in just a couple sentences, I'd say, you know, this one is improve constantly and forever the system of planning, teaching, learning, and service to improve every process and activity in the organization and to improve um, and to improve quality and productivity. It is management's obligation to work continually on the system, whether that's school design, curriculum, incoming supplies and materials, technology, you know, supervision, training, retraining, whatever, you know, whatever that thing is. And um if you can think back to when we talked about principle one, principle one and principle five are very similar in that they both talk about improvement of the system and processes over the long term. The distinction would be that principle one is talking about constancy of purpose, the aim of the organization. And this in turn facilitates this principle, principle five, continual improvement of systems and processes. I think sort of a key idea that you sort of mentioned, I think, even in this talk is that um, we have to keep front of mind that quality must, you know, be built in at that planning and design stage of work. And I think a lot of times in, um, in the education sector, we, we see teachers blamed for a lot of things that they have very little control over often. Um, and I think, you know, one example, as I was thinking of examples, was when a school system selects a curriculum, you know, they, they often select a curriculum for the entire system. But we don't often consider sort of that the downstream effects on teacher lessons and in, in turn student learning. Mm. You know, how many teachers have had the opportunity to select their their district's curriculum? You know, that that's a number probably close, close to zero. Um, but there are sort of many, I think, components of the education system that are analogous. And I think the same is true in, in other sectors as well. And I think that's why Deming really harped on this idea that it's management's obligation to continually improve the system because they're making so many of these decisions that then have these downstream effects on the frontline workers, you know, be it teachers in a school or nurses in a hospital or, you know, line workers in a, a, a you know, production um, facility. Um, and, th oh. and this, this, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that I, uh, I was recently teaching uh, an ethics class at a university in Cambodia called Cam Ed run by a guy named Casey Barnett. And he is an American guy who started it on his own, funded it on his own, and for mm -hmm. decades now has built this university. And he's built it around his principles and he sources his students his way. He has great relationships with, he's teaching accounting, finance, you know, business, which is the practical things needed in a developing economy or, you know, economy that's really growing like Cambodia. But it's just that, what I saw was the constancy of purpose when I went through the whole university and then I got to know more of the students and they've attended some of my valuation masterclass course and stuff online. And then I'm just like, ah, that constancy of purpose gives the, and the constancy of management, you know, gives the ability to continually improve. And yeah. that without that, with, constant turnover in leadership it's so hard yeah yep yeah and and management is hard leadership is hard i think you know um i think schools are you know facing some challenging times right now um you know because and this is true in any sector but 
you know, if you're a leader or you're in management, you have to deal with these day-to-day issues of the organization, then also sort of keep the organization moving towards continual improvement. Um, you have to put out these fires, but like Dr. Deming would often say, putting out fires does nothing to actually improve your, your system. You know, I think sort of the way he would frame it is that, you know, detection and removal of a special cause uh, does not improve a process. At best, you know, fighting fires, i.e. detecting special causes, just re- it's important because it does return uh, that process back to its previous state, but but that state is not where you want it to be necessarily. Smoldering. Smoldering, yeah. It, the way I heard this sort of stated in a great... Uh, book on Deming's work called The Deming Dimension by Henry Neve, who I'm sure a lot of listeners know. He said, you know, this means that systems leaders must strive to make unstable processes stable and to make stable but incapable processes capable and to make capable processes ever more capable. So, you know, you sort of start to break that down, you know, you can start to see why uh, being in management, why being a leader is not not an easy task, you mm, know. Mm. Um, um, you know, you, one of the questions. I, never, oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say this idea of never-ending improvement. You know, depending on what your mindset is around that type of thing, is it, you know, it can be daunting. You know, even for the most stalwart of sort of continual improvers. Yeah, and that, that may determine where you position yourself within an organization, because if it's if you're at the top. It's your responsibility, if, you yep. know, to be focused on that, you know, and building the system, which can be a bit overwhelming for some people. And they say, look, I'm I'm OK being in this spot and I'll try to improve what I'm doing in the classroom. But I may not be able to be involved in how we're improving, you know, all the systems. Um, I wanted to end this discussion on principle five with a little bit of uh, hope and vision of what's potential like. I think about my my little case. I have my valuation masterclass boot camp online, and mm-hmm. I just I'm going into the eleventh one right now. We're in the tenth one, and I'm I'm just doing it every every eight to ten weeks, and it's a six week program. I want repetition. I want to practice. I want to see how I can improve, and I've seen enormous improvements by just looking at the problems, solving them, going to the next level, and in 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 boot camp number ten. Basically, the students are valuing the same companies over the last couple of boot camps. A company called Taiwan uh, Manufacturing, Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, and then Toyota. And mm-hmm. so they're in groups and they're valuing those two companies. And I was really hesitant to show them the the, the progress of the prior students because I didn't want them to copy from that. But <laughs> I've now incorporated that in the boot camp, like halfway through, to say, "All right, here's the bar. Mm-hmm. This is the minimum." This is what the last group did using all the tools that we gave them. Now your job is to take this to the next level. And yesterday, a student posted something on LinkedIn that was an absolutely comprehensive takeaways of the stuff that he's been learning and applying. And it's like, it worked. Hmm. It inspired them to say, we got to go to the next level. And I just want to hear from you about when you work continually on the system what are some of the transformations and other things that you've seen and what's some hope for the people who are struggling in a system that's, you know, needs help? Yeah, that's, that's a really good frame. Uh, I don't know if it'll get to that level, but I, I think, you know, as I've sort of built my sort of, um, you know, Deming knowledge base and spread that here internally where I work, I think, I would go back to those two tools that I've talked about sort of repeatedly, the run chart or process behavior chart and the plan, do, study, act cycle. Mm -hmm. And why I'm saying that is because right now internally, we are running one, two, three, four, at least four PDSAs concurrently right now with different teams. And people are starting to see the power of this, especially in um, areas where you know, performance was struggling a bit. We put PDSAs in action just to take small steps to try to improve our system. And what's happening, whether we're running that PDSA, some of these are running for a week at a time, 
Some of them are running for up to three weeks at a time, depending on you know which area you're talking about. But what's happening is we get to the that act to decide what we're going to do next. For example, we had to make a purchasing decision. We're we have you know talent is a struggle right now in education. Mm-hmm. We had a, a platform that we were trialing for ten days, the free version, and then we have to decide are we going to pay for this, right? And with the PDSA, you get to that act. You looked at what happened over the weeks you you did the measures of the things that you thought were important. And that decision just jumps off the page. Mm. And so these things that people used to sort of go back and forth about, do we do this? Do we not? How do we know if this is effective? Now we have this structure that makes this decision just, like I said, leap off the page in terms of its obviousness and the direction that we're going to go. What are we going to do? Are we going to buy this thing? Are we going to spend the money? Are we going to put resources towards this, both in terms of the money it costs to purchase in this case, plus the human resources that's going to take to, to, to manage this platform? And in this case, the answer was yes. And mm-hmm. that's all because of the power of this way of thinking. You know, it, was, it wasn't about holding people accountable. It was about designing a good PDSA, running it, gathering the data that was important to us, and then evaluating that together. And then mm-hmm. making the decision. And so I think once people try that a few times, they'll both sort of see how clear the decision-making process can come. It doesn't mean all decisions are going to be easy, but it clarifies decisions. Mm-hmm. It gets you working together and planning something that's important to you as an organization, as a team. You get to see how people sort of think things are going to end up because they predict as a part of that plan section. And then once people get comfortable with that tool, they start owning it. They start running their own PSAs and they come to you and they say, oh my gosh, look at this. You know, look what happened. Look what I discovered. I didn't, I didn't know this was going to happen. I'm going to keep doing this. Can I go do this over here? Yeah. Let's set up a plan for that. You know? And so people start to get excited because they, they build this momentum with this tool and then you pair that with the way of thinking that Deming's philosophy gives you and your organization just starts to operate in a completely new, new way. And it's this sort of combination of the tools, which are important, but most importantly, this way of thinking that goes with the tools. Well, <clears throat> let me wrap up our discussion. We're talking about principles for transformation of school systems. And today we talked about principle four and principle five. And that is principle four, maximize high quality learning, minimize total costs. And we spent a lot of time talking about the importance of working with your suppliers, the inputs into your system. And the deeper you can build those relationships and connections with them, the, the better opportunities you have to improve the quality of what you're doing and to reduce the cost of what you're doing. And the second principle number five, the second thing we talked about was the idea of work continually on the system. You are operating within a system. We can see there's suppliers. There's also customers that you're supplying. Ultimately, what we're talking about is planning, teaching, learning, service. Those types of things are all defined as the system of what you're doing. And I think that you made the point that Ultimately, that's management's job. And it has to be done by management because it has a lot of downstream effects, as Deming has taught us, that ultimately the output, the majority of the output of any system is really based on what the system's capabilities are. And so your job in management is to try to improve those system capability. And maybe a teacher may find that a bit overwhelming but that's okay. That can be brought down to a small scale, maybe in a classroom. Is there anything else you'd add to that? Yeah. I mean, I think just overarching is that we're replacing those management myths with these sound guiding principles and that, you know, we're kind of going through them either one or two at a time, these episodes, but they are sort of a mutually supporting network of principles. And so uh, while we may learn these piecemeal, we want to put them all together because it's really, that's where the power comes from is when all of these principles are sort of working together um, uh, rather than in isolation. Well, John, on behalf of everyone at the Deming Institute, I want to thank you again for this discussion. For listeners, remember to go to Deming.org to continue your journey. You can find John's book, Win-Win, 
Dr. W. Edwards Deming, The System of Profound Knowledge and the Science of Improving Schools on Amazon.com. This is your host, Andrew Stotts, and I'll leave you with one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Deming. People are entitled to joy in work. Thank you.